Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this panel titled the, Ga the Case Against Normalization with Israel, Perspectives from the Gulf. Um, the talk is organized by the Gulf Coalition Against Normalization. The coalition was established in 2017 as an umbrella organization uniting various groups working in the Gulf to advocate for the Palestinian cause. When the current wave of normalization began this summer, the coalition started holding uh, regular seminars to highlight voices against normalization in the region and to discuss the issue from different lenses. Um, this is the first English webinar organized by the coalition. It is co-sponsored by the Students for Justice in Palestine at Georgetown University in Qatar and the Palestine Students Club at Northwestern University also in Qatar. So just to introduce our speakers, uh, we have Abrar Shimari, who is a research associate at the London School of Economics. She has an MA from Georgetown, uh, from Georgetown Center from Contem of Contemporary Arab Studies. Uh, we also have Samaya al Majdoub, who is a researcher from Bahrain. She holds an MA in Middle East Studies from George Washington University. And last but not least, we have Dr. Faisal Hamada, who recently completed his PhD in the, in the School of English and Drama at uh, the Queen Mary University. I'm Fatma al Hashimi, a student of public policy at Columbia University, and I will be moderating this event. Um, so, just to kind of introduce, um, our talk. So the new wave of normalization in the Arab world began this summer when the United Arab Emirates announced in August 13th that it, it, that it was going to officially normalize relations with Israel. Bahrain quickly followed suit, announcing in September 11 that it would enter a similar agreement. By the 15th of September, the two countries officially signed their normalization agreements with Israel at the White House in Washington, D.C. The UAE and Bahrain thus became the third and fourth Arab countries to normalize relations with Israel, respectively, after Egypt did so in 1979 and Jordan in 1994. Notably, Mauritania also normalized relations in 1999, only to freeze them once again a decade later in 2009 after the Gaza War. Um, so these are all Arab countries placed in a region with a history of resistance and struggle against the foundation of Israel on Palestinian lands. But to what extent is the Palestinian cause just an Arab issue? Um, the first question is directed at Faisal. Um, and we just wanted to start with a question that frames Palestine in our minds as people who care about justice and public and international policy. Um, many will tell you that the Palestinian cause is only relevant to Arabs and or Muslims. What do you say to that, Faisal? Um, Faisal, you're muted. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Fatma. Thank you, organizers, and thank you, everyone attending. Uh, so I will respond to that question by first saying that it is completely impossible to avoid the determinations of identity when discussing the question of Palestine and politics more broadly. But I find that, the, that very often these questions of identity are reductive rather than expansive. To put it in other terms, there is often a recourse to a kind of demographic determinism a logic of the census and the statistic where people are just check boxes of identities, whether Muslim, Jew, Christian, male, female, Arab, etc., and their political affiliations and determinations are thought to be somehow predetermined by the demogra demographic to which they belong. If the Palestinian cause does anything on an international level, it destroys this demographic logic by reinstating the importance of politics of solidarity. So the liberation of Palestine is not in its nature a, liber a religious conflict. It is and always has been a liberation struggle by a colonized people and their allies against a colonizing force. To reduce it to a religious conflict is a mystification of the true kernel of Palestinian liberation. And it is useful to the discourses of normalization. The recent wave of normalizations organized by the United States with Gulf countries are not named the Abraham Accords for nothing. It, it serves their purpose, it serves the purposes of imperialism more broadly, that this conflict be read as a religious conflict. It dehistoricizes it, and by dehistoricizing it, takes the actuality of politics out. 
It thus gives credence to the idea that normalization between Israel and any majority Muslim state equals peace, as if in any and all Muslim majority countries somehow stand in for the Palestinian people who, who are the stakes in, in the struggle. I take a small moment here to also remind everyone that Palestinians are a multi-religious group. The Palestinian Christians are some of the most strident, uh, Christians are some of the most strident critics of the colonial practices of the Israeli state. Let's not forget that Columbia professor of literature, Edward Said came from a Christian family, as did George Habesh, the left-wing revolutionary and founder of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. I raise these two names because they represent extremely varied poles of opposition to Israel. So the religious nature of the conflict is not something intrinsic to it, but something distinctly created by Zionism as the organizing principle of Israeli society. I think the extent to which Zionism permeates Israeli society is often underestimated because especially for people living in the Arab world, we have no real engagement with Israeli society itself. Another dimension of why this might be uh, the case is that Israel very often presents itself as a secular society and presents its form of Judaism as a secularization of Jewish identity. However, this is clearly not the case. Let's take, as, let's take as a starting example, the documentary Avenge, one of my, Avenge But One of My Two Eyes by director Avi Mughrabi. Mughrabi's film juxtaposes footage of Palestinians being humiliated on a daily basis by multiple facets of the Israeli military to footage of Jewish tourists, many of whom are American and on state-funded birthright trips, being indoctrinated into Zionism. The film is not for the faint of heart and demonstrates exactly how Zionism indoctrinates people into its narratives. By portraying the Jewish people as a timeless people engaged in a struggle for survival against a hostile world. In one particularly strong scene, a group of children uh, kind of arranged by an indoctrinator are, are told the story of Masada, the historic site where 900 Jews committed suicide to resist becoming Roman slaves. The children are pointed to four corners of a room. In one corner, there is a white flag representing surrender. In another, a Torah representing prayer. In the third corner is chewing gum representing a pill to take to commit suicide. And in the final corner, a gun representing battle and war. All of the kids, except for one little girl, go towards the gun and are applauded. The girl who goes to the white flag, which here is not the flag of peace, but the flag of surrender, is shamed in no uncertain terms. These kinds of practices are built into the very structure of Israeli society in what historian Chaim Rashid Zabner notes as a specific distinction between an imaginary of the Israeli Sabra or the heroic new Jew, a soldier of the new state against the inferior stereotype of the ghetto Jew, a figure that is rooted in histories of diaspora, anti-nationalism, and who is physically weak. The figure of the militarized Sadra Jew thus becomes the cornerstone in Rashid's reading of a society built out of war and sustained through war. Israel spends more on its military per capita than any other society. According to some accounts, this goes up to 8 to 10% of the GDP. This has led to a situation where it is actually impossible to separate the civic from the military in Israel and where the military itself is civic. It is not so much that the military controls the state, but instead that society at all levels and sectors is incorporated into the military and vice versa. Let's take the example of education, just briefly to demonstrate this point. As Brashith notes, most Israeli universities are built on the ruins of Palestinian towns and villages. They make up much of their income by running training programs for the Israeli military and security services, and US and EU research funding is used to present an academic front to security and defense projects in IT, drone technology, web security, surveillance systems, etc. And an example I always like to bring up in, with this is, is the Xbox Kinect, which is a kind of motion capture video game device, which was initially a, a research and development program by, the Israeli, by an Israeli tech company that was used to survey and motion capture Palestinians passing through border security and now exists in almost in, in tons of homes. This is all fundamentally rooted in a history put into motion by the Nakba, 
in a history which finds its foundation in the forced expulsion of an entire population and the militarized uh, policing of their daily life, Israel has become like a snowball of militarization, a self-fulfilling prophecy of violence. And a lot of these points that I'm taking, these talking points are from uh, Rashid Zabner's book, which is called An Army Like No Other, and I'd highly recommend the book. Uh, this initial violence set in motion escalating acts of violence that could only be upheld by the continuous militarization of society at large. By portraying itself as constantly under threat, Israel conceives of itself as always on the defensive, necessitating further and further militarization. We might like to think of this as the fault of the ruling party, the Netanyahu's party, which is clearly right-wing and, and really bad in all kinds of ways, but the brutal operations of the IDF, which are often named with silly or fun names, uh, often gain the approval of at least 90% of the population. The brutal 2014 attack on Gaza is reported to have gained 95% approval rating with the public. What then of normalization? What is normal about a society built almost exclusively as a war machine and which maintains its sense of collectivity through war, through dispossession and through victimization. Any thought that normalization might somehow deter Israeli violence is a fantasy. Just a few days ago, under the cover of the US election, the village of Khurbat Hamsa was demolished by Israeli bulldozers, leaving 74 people, including 41 children, homeless. And I'll stop there for now and leave it to the comrades to continue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Faisal. Um, so my second question is to Samaya. Um, Samaya, uh, there's a statement, a lot of people kind of say, we can understand why Egyptians, um, Lebanese and Jordanians have opinions on Palestine because it's right next door to them. Um, but the Gulf is a lot further away. Um, has Palestine even had that much of a connection to the Gulf historically? Um, what do you say to that? Yes, uh, thank you, Fatma, for your question, and thank you, uh, Faisal, for your introduction. Um, I think it's incredibly important for us to explore this connection, as you mentioned. So what is the connection of uh, the Gulf with Palestine? And I have a quick presentation that hopefully will help us um, navigate this question. So I'll just put it up. Um, All right, can you see the presentation? I will assume that's a yes. Yes, we can see it. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it shows. All right. OK, so it's on full screen now. All right, so there's two things that I would like to explore in this quick presentation. So what has been the Gulf solidarity with Palestine since the Balfour Declaration in 1917? And what are some of the contributions of Palestinians into the development of the Gulf states themselves? Um, and I think that uh, what I want to mention in this presentation is that this is in no way a comprehensive analysis of, of this question, but it's just trying to give um, our audience, our colleagues who are watching, um, some stories, some, some sort of anecdotes into, into this connection and to highlight it, right? Um, so the first thing that I want to mention is, for example, uh, Al-Hajj Amin al-Husseini's visit to the Gulf in 1928. So this man, Amin al-Husseini, he was the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem and later the president of the Arab Higher Committee. He's a very important figure in uh, the nationalist movement in Palestine and in um, forming a movement against uh, British imperialism when uh, Palestine was under the British mandate. So this person had an, a very important visit to the Gulf in 1928, um, and he not only collected donations for the restoration of um, holy sites in Palestine, but also to advocate and also to build transnational connections uh, between Palestinians and uh, their fellow Arab citizens all around in the region. So. Um, the, the campaign to raise funds had this sort of amount of donations. And I just want to highlight um, Bahrain and Kuwait here, as you can see in the table. Um, they, take, they take the fifth and the sixth uh, sort of rank in the amount of donations. And what I think is really important to highlight is that in this period of time, you're talking about the late 20s, the early 30s, 
the Gulf countries were undergoing a recession. So uh, the pearl um, industry was not doing very well. Oil was not, not discovered yet. So I think it's incredibly important for us to, to see how the Gulf public uh, was very much in solidarity with Palestine. And they were willing to put money into, into, into these um, commitments. So um, that's just a quick sort of um, illustration of that solidarity and, and, and commitment. Um, and then so, sort of moving on into the 1930s, a lot of important events happened there. So the 1936 and 39 revolt in Palestine against the British Empire. And then there was a, a, a report uh, by the Peel Commission in 1937 by the British Empire, basically recommending the partition of mandatory Palestine. Now, this report did not go unnoticed in the Gulf. There were major, major public reactions uh, and opposition um, to this report. And I want to just um, illustrate a few of them. Um, and so, yeah, this is the Arab High Committee that was uh, formulated in 36. You can see uh, the man in the middle, uh, uh, I mean, the Husseini that I mentioned before. Um, so in the 1930s, uh, for example, like um, I have a quotation here by a very important scholar, um, Rosemary Sa uh, Saeed Zahlan, who is the, um, the sister of Edward Said. Um, so, for example, uh, at that time in the 1930s, we have the king uh, of Saudi, Saudi Arabia, King Abdul Aziz, and she, she uh, I quote her she, saying that King Abdul Aziz rarely minced words of, of feelings when it comes to Palestine. Palestine, he made his reactions known to all who visited him. Um, so this is kind of like the official stance by the ruling class. It was very much in support and solidarity against this uh, this action. Um, in Kuwait, for example, we also have um, evidence uh, from our history. Um, you have a letter that was sent by Shabiba to Kuwait, this group, uh, the Young Men of Kuwait, um, who sent a letter to the British political agent that was um, in Kuwait at the time with sharp protest against His Majesty's government's methods towards our brothers, the Arabs of Palestine. So this is like in reaction to the Peel Report in 30, uh, in the 1930s. Um, also, we have uh, the Kuwait merchants who sent telegrams um, to the League of Nations at, and the British government uh, to, to protest this this, uh, this report that's recommended the partition of Palestine. Um, I think that you know, sort of like bringing into the discussion these um, these events is very important for us to understand the historical legacy of Gulf solidarity with Palestine in the 1930s. Um, I also have here um, a statement that was sent by a Bahraini club, the Arab club in Harag in in Bahrain, um, and they also sort of like published it in the local um, um, sort of media, news, newspapers, um, also exp expressing solidarity with Palestine and refusing the, 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 the Peel Commission report that was recommending the partition of Palestine. Also in Bahrain, there were major, major protests um, in 1947. So we're talking about the Nakba here, moving on to the 1940s. And um, when the United Nations uh, decision came out um, to partition Palestine and then the events of the Nakba started in, in 1947, um, the capital city of Manama was practically paralyzed for three days. There were major protests on the streets. Um, at the time, Bahrain was under the British mandate. So the British officers there arrested uh, a large number of people um, for for this uh, civic mobilization. So I think it's incredibly important for us to kind of like bring into discussion these these things. Um, I want to shift now to the other side of the equation. So not only were was the Gulf in solidarity with with Palestine, but Palestinians themselves had a very pivotal role in the development of Gulf states. Perhaps the sector of education is very very illustrative of this. Um, so uh, we have evidence of the first delegation of Palestinian teachers that arrived in Kuwait in 1936. Bahrain also received its first delegation of Palestinian teachers in 1940. Um, the arrival of these teachers was incredibly important into, into the establishment of the public education system in, in the Gulf, um, because uh, as you know, like in, um, in other countries, perhaps in the Levant or in Palestine, um, these institutions had been in existence way before they were established in the Gulf. Um, I want to mention a quick story here. Um, so Bahrain had a delegation of uh, seven uh, Palestinian teachers. And interestingly, after the arrival of one of them in the 1940s, the British uh, decided to deport him because apparently he was doing his job very well, um, because um, uh, the students that he had were sort of like developing their own critical awareness. They, um, had, they were connected 
to the national and, uh, and the, the press of the Arab countries at that time, whether it's Cairo, whether it's uh, in the Levant. And so, um, so you can see that the effect of these teachers coming into the Gulf was helping to create um, an awareness, uh, these transnational links, these, this Arab awareness that was happening in the Gulf. And the British at the time thought that this was very dangerous. And so they deported one of those teachers in Bahrain in the 1940s. Um, and then obviously like um, this, this, uh, this contribution of Palestinians into the Gulf doesn't stop in the 1940s. It continues up until today. If you're talking about Palestinian professionals, engineers, intellectuals, or artists who have contributed to the region um, very much in, in, in its uh, sort of development in, in every aspect. Um, and so, um, as I mentioned, like it's, it's credi incredibly important for me to summarize in 10 minutes uh, this, this connection, the Gulf-Palestine connection. But I think that's what is important to mention is that in every single um, juncture, whether it's the 1940s, whether it's the 53, uh, 56 Suez Canal War or 67 War or the oil embargo in 73 or the Intifada in the 90s or in the 2000s, um, you can see that the, the, the Gulf public um, and, and government and the ruling class was also very much in solidarity. Um, so I want to bring in a quick example, for example, from Qatar. Um, so uh, the 1956 uh, tripartite um, aggression. So this was sort of like when Britain was trying to take back the Suez Canal um, and, and uh, sort of like um, uh, in alliance with, or Israel was doing that and invading um, sort of Egypt um, and France was also um, supporting them. So there was a, a widespread uh, opposition to this um, aggression. And so I want to bring in a quick sort of uh, story from Qatar. Um, so for example, um, in the 1950s, when this uh, aggression had started, the next day, all shops in Doha remained closed as a sign of protest against the attacks. Workers in the oil company went on strike and pipe pipelines were cut at Umm al-Bab, which was not far, far from the refinery. The next day, people also gathered to protest and demonstrate against the attacks on Egypt, um, and they were led by um, Sheikh Hamad and Khalifa al-Atiyah, notable of Qatar. The, the following day, a general strike was also declared throughout Qatar, and the ruler refused to export Qatar to, uh, Qatari oil to Bahrain as a sign of protest against the, Brit the British. Um, and this is also an expert taken, uh, a quote taken from uh, Rosemary Zahlan's uh, book that I'll, I'll show a picture of at the end. Um, and so you, you see these demonstrations of solidarity, both by the public and um, the ruling class or, or the government. So I think it's important for us to kind of bring that in. You also have this figure, um, Sheikh Fahad uh, bin Ahmed, who was the younger brother of um, the prime minister and the foreign minister in Kuwait. He was also devoted to the Palestinian cause. He wasn't sort of like satisfied with just donating money. He physically went on and, and joined uh, the Kuwaiti army when they were fighting on the on the Egyptian uh, front. And so um, that's like another example sort of of a figure that. Um, was there. Um, so I do want to mention this book, Palestine and the Gulf Studies, uh, by Rosemary Saeed uh, Zahlan, who was the sister of Edward Saeed. Um, I also encourage you to follow the research of our colleague, Victor Dalal Rashoud, who also wrote a lot about this uh, sort of like connection between Kuwait and Palestine and, and, and the region. Um, so the last thing that I want to say, like, why do I have these slides and these pictures and these stories? The two points I really want to end with is that Gulf societies understood that the Palestinian struggle for national liberation um, from Imperial Britain and the Zionist settler colonial movement was tied to their own struggle for national liberation, right? So when we're talking about the, the activism in the 1930s and 40s, Gulf people themselves were under um, uh, the, the mandate of, of Britain. So they understood what it meant. Um, and I think that's important to kind of tie this point back to Faisal's point in the beginning about framing the, the, the issue of Palestine as a struggle for national liberation and not something, not sort of like an age old religious conflict that has started and will never end. That's a, that's a sort of inaccurate framing of the, of the issue and it's a disservice to the issue as well. Um, and the last thing is that we have a historical legacy and consistency of support. And I know hopefully later on we'll talk more about what's being done today um, in, in the Gulf to support uh, Palestine. I hope I'm not over my time. And uh, back to you, Fatima. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Samaya, for your very thorough presentation. Um, my next question is to Abrar. Um, so Kuwait, Abrar, stands out uh, from other uh, Gulf countries in its official stance against normalization, both currently and historically. 
Um, can you give us an idea of why this is the case um, and how does the cause manifest itself in cultural as well as political spaces in Kuwait? Thank you, Faisal. Thank you, Sumeya. Um, so I think this is definitely an important question for us to um, take the time to really think about. And primarily what we're really thinking about is uh, popular influence in the case of Kuwait. And I think Sumaya especially did a really good job uh, showing historically how we've seen this type of harmony uh, between the public sentiment as well as the official government stance um, in the Gulf throughout uh, its history when it comes to the issue of normalization. And uh, this shift that we're seeing now is definitely quite recent and has historically not been the case. Um, so while this is definitely true, um, the, the general public, I think, within Gulf societies continues to oppose normalization. Uh, with that said, the political systems in each of the six Gulf states vary. Um, and Kuwait's political system, I think, is the primary factor um, that gives its general public a relatively stronger platform to voice uh, th this type of opposition, primarily through the National Assembly. Um, which uh, Kuwaiti citizens get to um, elect. They get to elect their representatives through the National Assembly. Um, so this discrepancy that we're witnessing now uh, and the government attempts that we're seeing from um, some Gulf countries to silence critics of Israel in the name of um, combating anti-Semitism um, is definitely a contemporary phenomena and further reinforces, I think, Faisal's point on this framework of religious dialogue essentially being irrelevant. Uh, with that said, I think that Kuwait's political system is unique in the sense that it leaves significant room for civil society organizations especially uh, to play a prominent role in the decision-making process. So in Kuwait's case, we have um, three distinct branches um, or spaces for political activism um, and the decision-making process. So we have the executive branch, also known as the government or the cabinet, and we have the legislative branch, also known as the elected national assembly or the parliament, and we have civil society. Now, even though we have all three of these, and even though the past decade in particular has witnessed, um, I, I would argue, a severe regression in terms of the political uh, liberties that Kuwaitis enjoy um, in this country, uh, advocating for a continued boycott of Israel and the rejection of normalization poses no political threat um, to participating individuals, primarily because of the fact that this is a cause that the government itself um, is behind as well. So uh, up, and, up until this particular stage, um, this harmony has kind of been maintained in the case of Kuwait and the parliament and civil society have a large part to play in that as well. Now, a subcomponent of um, civil society, I think, are student organizations and student unions uh, who historically, since the 1970s up until this day, um, have continued to voice their condemnation of Israeli oppression, violence and occupation. They've done this through protests, they've done this through walkouts, and they've done this through official statements made by the university student organizations. So historically, they've proven to be active political actors, and I think this really aids in strengthening Kuwait's stance um, against normalization. This harmony kind of um, has proven to be one that has disseminated um, throughout the various players in Kuwait. And moving on to the second part of your question, um, I think another group of actors that are often overlooked when we're talking about politics in general and not just um, th this particular issue of normalization are cultural producers, uh, both in Kuwait and globally. And I think when we're talking about and, and thinking about culture in its various forms, whether that's music, literature, poetry, um, dance, theater, uh, we have to consider the different power dynamics at play in these cultural spaces and how culture has the ability to essentially create power to resist power. So we want to think of these spaces as spaces where uh, different political and social realities are kind of contested and challenged, which is definitely the case um, in Kuwait's uh, cultural sphere historically. Kuwait uh, was home to Naji Ali, uh, Ghassan Kanafani and numerous other renowned authors who launched their cultural works to the world from Kuwait. Uh, 
So they were essentially able to use this as a form of soft power. That's in the case of Kuwait. Of course, globally speaking, we have Mahmoud Darwish, uh, Murid Barghouthi, Ibrahim Nasrallah, all whose works were translated into English and other languages. And I think the power um, of um, cultural production, especially, is not something that can really be undermined when it comes to its political influences. And this, I think, goes back to our original question, which is what distinguishes Kuwait from its neighbors. Um, we see that even the cultural sphere is one that is still um, dominated by grassroots initiatives um, rather than state-led. And state-led initiatives have definitely come into play from roughly 2016 onwards. But unlike its neighbors, um, the, the scene is primarily still dominated by grassroots cultural initiatives. And we also notice that the state-led initiatives are um, notably apolitical compared to the very activist type of uh, nature that we see from the grassroots cultural platforms. So we've seen local bookstores and, and art galleries that have hosted and promoted Palestinian authors and artists. Uh, they've held events in solidarity with Palestinian activists, and they've worked on raising awareness to the younger generation um, on what the cause even is. And I think this is especially important um, in this day and age when, by and large, the education curriculums across the GCC have no mention of Palestine. Um, so the fact that this became a cause that the cultural platforms chose to kind of take on um, shows the importance of carrying it forward, generationally speaking, I think. On a more international scale, uh, we see a continued utilization of culture as a tool of both soft power and resistance. So in the three branches of BDS that we're talking about, we're talking about um, economic, academic, and cultural. The third one is one that has the ability to, to be disseminated among the masses in ways that the first two may not. Um, we see that Israel continues to use culture as a form of propaganda and to whitewash its occupation of Palestine, um, meanwhile, Palestinians and non-Palestinian organizers have done an excellent job countering that propaganda with cultural production that aims to bring forth productive conversations about film, culture, and the diaspora using the lens of Palestinian artists as an entry point specifically. And I think one really good example of this is the DC Palestinian Film Festival. Um, and they, they hold this annual film festival, which this year actually took place uh, virtually in light of COVID, um, where they display a number of films and hold a number of discussions um, that shed light on various dimensions of what's basically a transformational Palestinian identity, uh, what it's like to live under occupation, and the struggles and triumphs of the Palestinian diaspora. So the Palestinian diaspora has a large um, role to play when it comes to organizing such events internationally to a wider audience. We've also seen um, numerous Western artists receiving backlash for accepting invitations to perform in Israel, um, including uh, Lorde, Shakira, uh, Lionel Richie, Lionel Del uh, Lana Del Rey, and a number of others, all who, after they were pressured by the public, announced that they would not be participating and that they would not be performing um, in Israel. And even though they made statements that might come off as relatively mild um, compared to what we would aspire to, um, such as, for example, Lana Del Rey saying that um, her premise was basically equality over apartheid. Um, this was definitely taking on a stance that was controversial in this sphere that we're talking about. Um, it was basically a political act of support for the Palestinians in their struggle uh, for basic human rights and to end the occupation. And more importantly, I think, especially in these types of spaces, um, that are creative or cultural um, in their nature, it starts a conversation. Um, so when Lana Del Rey decides that she is not performing um, in Israel as a result of concerns over human rights, that kind of gets her fan base um, to stop and ask, well, what's going on? Um, and I think th this type of community that perhaps we don't usually tap into is one that would definitely be useful to tap into in the long run. So it's kind of like this inadvertent effect um, of the pressures to uh, on these Western artists to 
um, participate in the cultural boycott um, of Israel. So we benefit um, from various different dimensions um, when we get cultural producers and cultural actors involved um, in the BDS movement. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Abrar, for this detailed look at Kuwait. Um, and now my next question is to Faisal. Um, if we submit, this is kind of a, another kind of misconception. Um, if we submit that Israel was founded on the basis of settler colonialism, so, so were many other states, right? Like the US, Canada, Australia, all these countries were based on settler, uh, settler colonialism. Can't we look at this as ancient history that we should overcome after all these years? Uh, what do you say to that? You're on mute. Yeah, so at first I really wanna thank both speakers uh, for really uh, fleshing out uh, what, what's actually happening in the Gulf. Uh, and this is not what I'm doing at all. Uh, I'm I'm kind of really trying to to uh, paint a picture here of what the thing is that we're dealing with, uh, especially considering how how little we know about that thing broadly and about its its kind of its structure of life and its structure of politics, etc. Uh, it's so I'll answer that question at first very simply. I will say that if the indigenous people of Australia, the U.S., or Canada uh, asked us to collectively boycott, divest from, and sanction their states, I think we have a political duty to do so. And I think that's something we should be pushing for and active, actively working towards if we are asked that by the indigenous people of those states in, in as, as clear and as organized a way as the Palestinian people and Palestinian civil society has asked of us to respond to Israel with the BDS campaign, which I probably touched on a bit and I think will be spoken about more later. Uh, okay, uh, as to the question of ancient history, uh, as I noted earlier, the normalization of violence and war in Israeli society is a consistent and ongoing facet of Zionism, which is the main ideology that organizes Israeli society. And it is by its nature an exclusionary ideology. Zionism works by equating the fate of Israel with the fate of all Jews. It links the fate of all Jews to the oppression of Palestinians. And it kind of ties this oppression and the upkeep of this oppression to the continuous militarization and war of its society and state. It's a vicious cycle with no way out, certainly not through normalization. If we look to the major historical example of normalization, which is the Camp David Accords signed by Anwar Sadat, what followed? Did Israel commit to peace? No. Israel first bombed an Iraqi nuclear facility in June 1981. It next illegally annexed the Golan Heights, an annexation that remains to this day. And this was finally followed up in, uh, by, the, by the act that this was all building up to, which was called, ironically, Operation Peace in Galilee, which is the invasion of Lebanon and the incredible violence of that particular war, which included the massacre at Sabah and Shatila. The history of Israel is this. When one front closes due to normalization or treaty, new fronts are opened up. This fact should make us all very, very worried right now, I think. To follow up on this, we must understand how, Israeli, how Israel is not a colonial state in the classic understanding of the term. For one, in historical colonialism, the colony was represented as the interest of a single colonial power. We can think of the French in Algeria or the Belgians in the Congo. The Zionist project cannot be thought of as necessarily the tool of a single colonial power, power anymore. It began with support from the British, whose policies and control of Mandate of Palestine served as the basis for the initial colonization. It was then supported by the French, who were one of the first countries to recognize Israel in 1949, and concurrently one of the first or one of the earliest suppliers of weapons to the Israeli army. Finally, and this is the history we are most familiar with, it is supported by the United States in a variety of ways. Israel is known to be the largest recipient of US aid internationally 
and most, if not all, of this aid is military aid. Significantly, the U.S. also supports Israel politically by vetoing various U.N. resolutions which delegitimize Israeli land-grabbing policies and continuous acts of war and aggression. And this quote, I mean, we're all gonna be really sad to hear it, but President-elect of the United States, Joe Biden, said in 1986, Israel, Israeli aid is the best three billion investment the United States makes. If there weren't an Israel, the United States of America would have to invent an Israel to protect her interests in the region. However, we shouldn't also forget the response of Israel when the Obama administration, in a last feeble act, probably more rooted in Obama's personal dislike for Netanyahu than any real solidarity with Palestine, refused to veto a UN Security Council resolution demanding the halting of the building of illegal settlements in the West Bank. Israeli officials, in a kind of mimicry of anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, accused Obama of secretly cooking up, quote, secretly cooking up with Palestinians an extreme anti-Israel resolution. And this was simply a resolution that, that the US refused to veto, which called for a halt in the building of illegal settlements and decreed the expansion of the settlements illegal. I raise this example to illustrate how Israel, while it might have historically been rooted in the, in the specific interests of Western colonialism and imperialism, has today gone beyond this. I hope it isn't too controversial to say this, rather than see Israel as simply an outgrowth of, or an extension of Western imperialism today, I think today, more so than ever before, it is important for us to realize that Israel itself is an imperial and colonial power with a relative degree of autonomy. It doesn't need America to tell it what to do. It does what it wants to do, even as the Obama example demonstrates in the extremely rare and, and insignificant moments when America does not condone its policies. On the flip side of this argument that I'm making, we can look to how imperialism works today in the example of the recently announced Trump orchestrated normalization with Sudan. In order to achieve this normalization, the US subjected Sudan to what can only be described as blackmail and extortion. Under this atrocious deal, Sudan was asked to pay $335 million in compensation to the United States and normalize with Israel in order to receive funds it desperately, desperately needed to help its ailing economy and address its humongous debt to the international organizations. But most importantly, it, it would be taken off the US's terror watch list, which comes with all kinds of negative repercussions for the Sudanese. So this is one example of how imperialism works today. Another example is that of Haifa port, which is an important terminal in the Mediterranean, an important logistics hub in the Mediterranean. A day after the recent uh, spate of normalizations, a major Gulf logistics company entered into a joint bid with Israeli shipyards company to bid on the contract for the privatization of this port. This demonstrates that imperialism today doesn't have to have one font or source. It is multi-pronged, multifarious, with economic political interests that cannot be simplified into one imperialism. The Zionist state's role in this international axis of imperialism as one of the world's largest arms manufacturers and traders, as an increasingly important global logistics hub, and as a center for technological development is clear. All of this, as the historian and critic Ilan Pape notes, is contingent on Israel's incessant colonization of Palestinian land. As Pape puts it, the state of Israel is still colonizing, building new colonies in the Galilee, in the Negev, and in the West Bank for the sake of increasing the number of Jews there. Dispossessing Palestinians and denying the right of the natives to their homeland. So this is all a lot to take in, I think, but it, I think these points are really important to kind of let sit in our heads. <laughs> 
to conclude, I want to discuss a particularly difficult topic, which is that of anti-Semitism. This is difficult because of the fact that anti-Semitism is real and pernicious and can be found in all corners of social, political life and discourse, but also because it is concurrently being weaponized to crush any criticism of Israel. The, the weaponization of anti-Semitism has long been a strategy of Israeli propaganda. It associates the criticism of Israel itself with anti-Semitism. This can be found, for example, in the recently approved International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance's definition of anti-Semitism as including, quote, denying the Jewish people their right to self-determination, for example, by claiming that the existence of a state of Israel is a racist endeavor. This definition clearly sits at odds with the fact that Israel is definitionally racist. It differentiates between what it calls citizenship rights, which are granted to all citizens, and a vast amount of nationality rights, which are only granted to Jews. The weaponization of anti-Semitism can be found in frankly ridiculous attempts to smear the former US presidential candidate, Bernie Sanders, a Jew renowned for his own solidarity with Palestine as anti-Semitic, or with laws in the US that penalize companies that cut ties with Israeli settlements. The examples abound, and one could talk a whole talk about just these. And I think I'll stop there. How am I doing on time? Am I okay? You're good. Okay, I'll read my little conclusion then. So it is easy and commonplace and true to say that implying that equating Israel with all of Judaism is itself anti-Semitic. And I think we can add to this truism the fact that nothing is endangering Jewish lives around the world more than the presence of a violent, militarized colonial enterprise built to oppress a native population and that claims it is their only protector. As opposed to statements which contend that normalization will be a solution to all of this, I think it is very clear that it will only make us a part of the problem. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Faisal, for, for giving us basically the, the context of Israel and giving us and constantly shedding light on, on these important issues. Um, now, for Samaya. Uh, what is currently being done to oppose normalization in the Gulf states specifically, and how can regular people help? Yes, thank you, Fatma, for this question. As Faisal said, we don't want to be part of the problem. We want to be part of the solution. And for the viewers who are tuning in for the first time, I do want to give a quick introduction into the Gulf Coalition Against Normalization. So um, as mentioned in the introduction, this coalition was founded in 2017. Um, it, is, it consists of four uh, major collectives that have been working to support Palestine in the Gulf, um, including the Bahraini Association Against Normalization, Qatar Youth Against Normalization, BDS Kuwait, the BDS chapter in Kuwait, and the fourth one is um, a youth organization called Youth for Quds, and they have a Gulf chapter as well. So, so the coalition is made up of these four collectives in addition to many, many members in the Gulf who have joined uh, the efforts of the, the coalition to express solidarity. So this is sort of like one platform that have existed and that we are sort of presenting our, web our webinar uh, through today. In addition to webinars and, and trying to raise awareness on the issue, um, the Gulf Coalition sort of really believes in collective action. It believes in building transnational networks of support, whether it's like working together in the Gulf, working in the Arab region, or building connections with global movements of solidarity. And I want to bring in quickly sort of the example of BDS Kuwait. Um, BDS stands for Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions. It is a Palestinian uh, movement that was founded in 2005. Um, it is Palestinian in its establishment, but it is global in its reach. Um, now, after many years of its establishment, it's sort of like, I think, known to many people uh, when they hear the term BDS. Um, and BDS, as the term um, yeah, and states, um, is an advocacy tool and its main advocacy tool is boycotts. 
boycotting um, any type of um, Israeli institution or cultural production um, to voice uh, solidarity with Palestinians and to sort of like move the consciousness of the international community to take action um, for Palestinians. Um, I want to mention sort of like quick things that BDS Kuwait has done. I mean, I think that a lot of times like people when they tune into these webinars and they have the criticism that, oh, you're just like talking into this online meeting, nothing is being done on the ground, but that's not the, that, that's not true. There's a lot of things that are being done on the ground. Um, I want to bring in, for example, one campaign that BDS Kuwait had led in 2014. Um, and uh, this campaign was against a French company called Viola, which was uh, building a uh, railway in occupied Palestinian territories. And so this company was sort of like put on the list of uh, BDS and uh, BDS Kuwait managed to successfully um, convince the Kuwaiti municipality to withdraw its investment or withdraw um, the company Viola from its sort of uh, tender uh, process. So this boycott campaign resulted in Viola losing almost $750 million in Kuwait as a result of this effort, in addition to losing many other contracts all around the world because of this organized BDS campaign all around the world. And eventually, Viola did actually withdraw from all contracts and all work that was being done on occupied Palestinian territories. So I think that this is sort of like a very important example to show you how there are collectives in the Gulf that are connected to a global movement of solidarity that's bringing in actual results, whether it's an economic boycott or an advocacy. That's one example. And there's like, for example, other companies like G4S, which is an international security company that's also um, uh, the global BDS movement is trying to sort of like put a spotlight on because um, they provide a lot of the software and the hardware for um, security inside um, settlements. So um, also BDS Kuwait has managed to convince uh, the ministry, uh, one of the ministries in, uh, in Kuwait to actually pull their investments from from that company and they're still sort of like working on it. Um, so in addition to other things, like for example, uh, legal campaigning, trying to put in resolutions um, within parliament that uh, supports uh, boycotts um, and divestment. So um, that's like a quick example from Kuwait. If I wanna move on to Bahrain, for example, um, as I mentioned in my earlier intervention, there has been a historical solidarity with Palestinians, whether it's through um, literary clubs, cultural clubs, political associations, all of these institutions have expressed solidarity um, to Palestinians and against normalization. Um, for example, in Bahrain, there is a, an umbrella initiative called the National Initiative Against Normalization. It holds over 20 civil society organizations in Bahrain. It holds one of the biggest women's groups. It hold, it's also um, it holds one of the biggest unions in Bahrain. And uh, this umbrella platform um, is sort of like a vehicle for the Bahraini public to mobilize in support of Palestine and against um, normalization. And so I think that if you are um, in Bahrain, um, you know, you can check out uh, what these organizations are doing and follow their work as well. Um, and so that's something that I wanted to mention. The last point I wanted to also highlight is that um, you can oppose normalization in your own in your own field of work, right? Um, I think Faisal and, and Abrar also mentioned this. It's very important for us to look at things like academia, like sports, like arts or in business. Um, so if you're an artist, um, you also have a responsibility and you have a role to play. Um, um, and this is sort of done with the um, academic boycott or with the sports boycott or the cultural boycott. Um, and there are numerous, numerous examples of people um, boycotting conferences or boycotting um, championships uh, to express this opinion. And I think it's a very powerful tool, as Abrar mentioned earlier. Um, it really brings into attention um, this, the Palestinian struggle and, and bring awareness to communities that otherwise would not have been aware um, of the issue. Um, and again, um, we have numerous examples. There isn't really enough time, but I just want to mention maybe two um, uh, of, of uh, and when it comes to uh, sports. So we have a lot of examples of golf uh, athletes who have withdrawn from uh, championships or matches uh, because there was participation by Israeli uh, national teams or, or athletes. So, for example, in, in 2017, a Saudi karate player um, withdrew from, from the karate match that he was participating in. Um, we have another example from Saudi in 2014. Um, we had the, the Saudi taekwondo champion 
who was participating in the Rio de Janeiro uh, 2016 Olympics, who also withdrew um, because he wanted to express his solidarity and to boycott uh, the match because there was another Israeli athlete who was who was also participating. And we also have a lot of examples from Kuwait, from Bahrain. Um, and maybe I'll just end with this. Um, when it comes to sort of like mobilization in Bahrain, we have also examples of um, Gulf businesses that have pulled out of uh, economic conferences or deals. Uh, for example, when we had a global entrepreneurship conference in Bahrain in 2019, we witnessed a huge number of participants who decided to withdraw because there was a, an official uh, Israeli delegation that was invited to participate. Um, in addition, obviously, to the uh, famous Kushner uh, conference that was held in Bahrain, the Peace for Prosperity uh, conference, that was also very much uh, boycotted by a lot of people and, 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 and opposed. Um, and so um, hopefully, like, uh, that's answers the question basically like there are there are popular reactions in in the region and these are collective actions across different organizations not just with like um sort of like um anti-normalization organizations it's also found in women's groups and unions and uh, uh cultural organizations and sports organizations so i think that um Whatever you do in life, you do have a role that you that you can play to express um, solidarity. And maybe just a very last point that I will conclude with is to say that um, what's incredibly important is to highlight is that the Gulf is a very diverse region. We are a region of 50 million people. We disagree on a lot of things, but one of the things that we do agree on is Palestine. And so this consensus um, has historically existed and it continues to exist. And this is why we see that in um, initiatives, for example, in Bahrain, we have political associations of very different um, schools of thought. So you have uh, conservative, li li uh, liberal, uh, leftist, Islamist groups all agree on um, expressing solidarity to Palestine and uh, opposing normalization. And so we find them no mobilizing on this issue where, where they may not mobilize necessarily in consensus on other issues. So I think that's incredibly important. There is a a sort of like collective action um, that's being built across different lines and across different um, groups in, in the Gulf. Yeah. Thank you so much, Samaya. And as Samaya said, I mean, part of the objectives of this talk is to have people get more involved in these in these kinds of initiatives. And we definitely hope that encourage people to look into them further. Um, now, my next question and final question actually is to Abrar. But before that, I want to tell everybody that um, you should be feel free to write any questions that you have, whether on this platform, whether on Twitter or on YouTube live, uh, live chat. There's a bunch of ways that you can participate in this. Um, so going back to, Abra, to Abrar, um, Abrar, how do forms of opposing normalization vary depending on positionality? Uh, we can't hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. Thank you for your question, Fatima. Um, I think this question of positionality goes back to a really good point that Sumaya just made, um, which is that regardless of where you are in life and who you are, there are ways that you can find um, in order for you to play a part in the BDS movement and to oppose normalization. So specifically when we're talking about positionality, what we're talking about is how differences in our social positions and power shape our identities and our access across society. So this um, determines what networks we can tap into. This determines who our uh, surroundings are. And it's important for us to be conscious and continuously self-reflective when it comes to our positionality, particularly in our regional context, I think, um, where there's such varying power dynamics and political contexts. Um, so this question of positionality essentially determines what tools we would be able to use. Like I mentioned, what networks we can tap into, and perhaps also equally importantly, uh, what consequences we would have to deal with. And I think this question of consequences is definitely a valid concern that a lot of um, Khalijis in particular have um, in the past period that we've been witnessing this, um, you know, uh, increased intimacy, let's say, uh, with this idea of normalization. 
um, even though op opposing normalization is absolutely everyone's responsibility, but at the same time, I think given the fact that these consequences are very real, it's also expected and rational um, that the forms of opposing normalization would vary depending on positionality. And I think Sumaya did a really good job um, highlighting a number of examples of real life situations that any of us could be in, whether we're in a country that has normalized or that has not, and how we can kind of navigate um, those types of situations without falling um, into the mistake of normalization. Um, I, and I think that these, are, these examples are important to keep in mind, particularly when we're talking about um, if your positionality means that you live currently in a Gulf country that has normalized um, and that has made BDS activism illegal or perhaps any forms of activism illegal really, um, that would definitely put the individual in a risky position if he or she were to publicly um, advocate against normalization. And I think another really tricky um, position to be in is uh, when we're talking about uh, Palestinians who currently live in a Gulf country that has normalized, especially if we're talking third, fourth generation Palestinians, you know, um, who historically have um, essentially considered considered this country their second home, um, have found that there had in the past at least that there was no evidence that this um, would eventually happen. There was no way, I think, for any of them to be able to predict that. Um, so in these types of situations, it's quite precarious um, to engage in the type of activism that we would ideally aspire to. Um, and in these types of situations is when I think um, tentatively and delicately navigating these types of limitations while at the same time um, preserving our moral commitment to the BDS movement um, is necessary. In our case as Kuwaitis though, I think we still have a space that uh, allows us to continue to publicly advocate for BDS. So in our case, it's therefore our responsibility to preserve that stance and preserve that space and not allow for it to be taken away. Um, in recent weeks, for example, as candidates in Kuwait have been preparing for the upcoming parliamentary elections, we've seen a campaign where a string of candidates have made it clear that they would oppose any attempts um, of normalization by the government, as unlikely as that may be, but I think um, it's quite telling that th these are positions that are being made public. So for us as voters and as Kuwaiti citizens, it's important for us to ask a can candidate very, very explicitly um, what their position is on BDS and to hold them accountable um, in the future. And I think exposing, um, naming and shaming politicians, companies or individuals found to be in violation of BDS is another example. Um, and BDS Kuwait does an excellent job of this. I think uh, Sumaya mentioned the example of um, G4S um, and one of the ministries in Kuwait. So that was um, the BDS Kuwait branch holding this ministry accountable for it. Um, even though, you know, by, by Kuwaiti law, it's still considered uh, illegal to have any type um, of interaction with Israel. Now, when this positionality transfers to a different geographic location, such as, for example, let's say if we're talking about Khaliji students in the United States or in the United Kingdom, um, they too would have the responsibility as individuals to continue um, to be active participants um, of, the, the, of, the, of the BDS movement. For example, they'd have access to organizations such as the SJP chapters in their respective universities. And I think there's a number of ways that a lot of them can get involved, depending on uh, what services, for example, that they can volunteer. Um, they can volunteer their time. Um, they can offer to engage in video production, in event planning, in social media coverage, whatever it is really that you're good at. But I think, um, employing these types of skills um, into a cause that is worthy is definitely valuable in the long run. On a larger scale though, I think it's important for us to recognize that universities in general are an influential space uh, for student activism. Whether we're talking about our own countries such as the student unions that we, we've seen um, historically in Kuwait or whether we're talking overseas such as in the United States or in the United Kingdom. So acts that might seem small or simple, um, like setting up a booth or visiting different campuses to talk to students and let's say display Palestinian films, um, actually have a really significant impact on influencing perceptions. 
um, and also being vocal and outspoken during class discussions on BDS and Palestine is really important. At times, I think, um, depending on you know which city you're, you're living in and which university you're at, even which, what course you're taking, it might um, feel like quite a lonely experience if, for example, you're the only person in the class um, that, um, for, for example, might be critical of the way that the rhetoric is kind of being shaped uh, when it comes to this type of discussion. Um, but but that, that's, I think, the core of what we're saying, all of us here, um, is that these types of actions are actions that do require um, courage. And even though there is definitely strength in numbers, um, but in cases where you might be the only individual, then, you know, it really just requires that you kind of amp up um, that sense of courage and obligation. With that said, though, um, even on U.S. campuses, or perhaps even especially on U.S. campuses, there are definitely consequences for those who are involved um, with SJP or any type of pro-Palestine activism. Um, there's definitely consequences for Arab Americans, um, and this can get can and does actually. There's a lot of evidence that shows that it does um, get in the way of uh, future employment prospects. But at the same time as U.S. citizens, um, Arab Americans, for example, um, going back to the point on positionality, have the ability to lobby their politicians and organize their community members. And I think um, as perhaps small as the margin of progress may seem, um, but, but that has definitely been visible um, in the past decade or so in the United States. Um, and I think especially when we're looking at um, both SJP chapters, Arab Americans and pro-Palestine organizers in general, um, building uh, bridges of solidarity and allyship is another thing that's really important that has already been happening on the ground. Um, one example that comes to mind is uh, the Jewish Voices for Peace organization, which is a group of Jewish American leftists um, who are also openly quite uh, critical of uh, Israel and that I think is um, evidence of the fact that being critical of Israel does not mean uh, or, or is not equated with anti-Semitism. At the bare minimum though I think all of us can work on educating ourselves and those around us. Um, going back to this concern um, of the fact that uh, all GCC curriculums currently um, are not educating younger students about this cause. Um, this, I think, emphasizes the fact that it's important to find resources, and there's plenty of resources now, uh, that would help those who are keen to understand, learn what BDS is, why it's important, and how they can participate. Um, and I think especially when we're talking about this um, current generation of teenagers who's very tech-savvy, um, it's important for them to educate themselves as well as their peers, you know, start these types of conversations in school, um, even on their WhatsApp groups. Um, I've seen even TikTok videos, you know, they're finding really creative ways um, to talk about important, heavy topics in ways that are kind of um, uh, easier for people to consume. At the same time, um, it's important for us and for people who want to educate themselves about this to be mindful of what kind of um, sources they want to choose to educate themselves about this. So Netflix, for example, might be a popular uh, platform for entertainment, but at the same time, it is one that propagates the same type of Israeli propaganda that the occupation itself propagates. Um, so you would find the number of films that are supposedly branded to be Palestinian films, but actually the producers are Israeli, the actors are Israeli, and the narrative is one that definitely feeds into um, the Israeli propaganda. Um, so these are all examples of how forms of uh, opposing normalization might vary uh, depending on one's positionality. And I think at the end of the day, uh, whatever form a person takes on is one that the individual knows uh, would help push BDS advocacy and Palestinian justice, however small it might seem or however large and controversial it might be. Thank you so much, Abrar. Um, so just to go um, over to our, uh, to the questions that have been asked in the chat, I'm combining two questions right now and I'm gonna be posing it to Samaya. Um, Samaya, so 
now that the election results have come out in the United States, how might Biden's coming to office change anything in the dynamics here? Um, do you think Biden will support and build uh, relations with Palestine? And also, I think combining another question, is the U.S. Um, putting pressure on the GCC to normalize? So is this kind of a result of, of, of U.S. pressure ultimately? Thank you. Great, thank you, and thank you to those who pose these questions because I think they're important. On the first question of will Biden change the dynamics, I think that Faisal did mention um, early on in his intervention that um, Joe Biden sort of like comes from the establishment. He expressed a lot of solidarity with Zionism, and I don't think that I would put too much hope, um, and I think a lot of analysts have also said that, of the official sort of like U.S. policy changing um, the dynamics. However, if we are talking about dynamics, I think that one of the interesting uh, developments that have happened in the public discourse around Palestine in the U.S. is that um, the, the conversation on Palestine has become more nuanced. Um, you see discourse that's coming out, for example, of the Democratic Party, so maybe not from Joe Biden himself, but from the party that he is from, a more nuanced conversation. You see um, an acknowledgement of uh, the continued oppression of Palestinians, um, the sort of disregard of Israelis uh, to, to the human rights of Palestinians. And so I think that a lot of things have happened in the past couple of years, whether it's BDS, as Abrar mentioned. Um, you know, I think that BDS is incredibly active in uh, US campuses. And that, that's, this activism has actually had an impact on the public discourse around Palestine in the US. So I think that we, would, we shouldn't necessarily put so much hope into Biden changing the dynamics, but taking more of a long-term view um, on uh, how Palestine is discussed um, in, in the public discourse um, in the U.S. So I think that would be sort of like my, my quick answer. If anyone else has anything to add, please feel free. Um, just to jump into the second question around, did the U.S. put pressure on GCC countries? I think that, the, yes, the short answer is yes, there has been um, pressure. However, it's not an excuse, um, and it is not a very... I think, sound way to uh, take uh, foreign policy decisions. And it is a very short-sighted decision as well. I don't think it's going to benefit our region in any way. Um, but I mean, I think one example that I have mentioned in other webinars we had in the coalition in Arabic that I will just bring in to illustrate US pressure is that uh, Bahrain used to have an official customs boycott office. We had a office that was uh, monitoring all of the merchandise that was coming into Bahrain. And if any of it uh, came from Israel, that merchandise would be sent back, right? Um, so this office was very much active since the 1950s like, or 60s because the Arab League had this resolution for all Arab countries to establish boycott offices. And, and this was a very powerful tool. And, and why, do, why was it powerful? Because in 2005, when Bahrain was negotiating a free trade agreement with the US, um, and this agreement was discussed in Congress, Congress made the observation and said that we will not sign a free trade agreement with Bahrain until Bahrain closes this boycott office in its country, in, in, in the country. So I think that, uh, and Bahrain did so, Bahrain did close the boycott office and then signed the free trade agreement. So we do have this sort of like example of US pressure uh, put on a country like Bahrain to uh, close this, this office. Um, and so I, I think that the answer to the question of, of regional or US pressure is that yes, the pressure does exist. It is not an excuse. And I think that there is a margin in which countries can move in and navigate the, 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 the international environment without sacrificing uh, the principled approach of solidarity to Palestinians that, you know, um, that has never changed in terms of the Arab publics. But when Arab governments take this position of normalization, they're sort of like putting, uh, they're widening the gap between what people think and how the official sort of position um, is, is stated and, and acted on. So yeah, those, those, are, those are my answers. And uh, back to you, Fatma. Thank you. Um, I think the next question should go to Faisal. Um, and I think you already touched upon this in your talk. Um, there's a tendency in the West and now even in the Gulf to conflate anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. How, how do you respond to that? 
you're muted. Uh, I keep expecting you to unmute me. I don't know why. Uh, so there's a point in the in the comments that asks why this is in English, and I just want to kind of reiterate that that the the Gulf Coalition Against Normalization does most of its talks in Arabic, uh, but uh, it was we thought it was a good idea to have one in English. Why not? Uh, a lot of people speak English. Uh, but yeah, most of these presentations are done in Arabic, which is the language that we should be having this in. But as a lot of people uh, speak English and are comfortable in the language, we've also decided to have one in English too. So that's just a response to Kanye East <laughs> in, the, in the comments. Uh, in response to, to the question about uh, anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism, yes, there is a lot of pressure, a lot of legal pressure mounting to equate those two things uh, however, there's also a lot of pushback against that pressure from all kinds of activist organizations, and not just uh, ones exclusively dedicated to the Palestinian cause, even though they are. So the, the labor left, which has now been completely destroyed in the UK uh, through concerted efforts by, by the media and by, and by the, the kind of hardcore center of the party, have been active in, in, in ensuring that, that there is a space for the freedom to criticize Israel and not have that immediately devolve into anti-Semitism. Uh, there are many Jewish groups who, who, I mean, I lived in the UK for five years and at the Palestine rallies, there were many Jewish groups who were out there and their, and their line was Israel should not speak in my name. And that is also something we should always remember. There is, there is a hardcore resistance to Israel, even amongst the diasporic Jewish community, uh, and an organized one at that as well. Uh, and as as for anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism, it's 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 really difficult to to argue that once you actually look at the practices that Zionism does on the ground in Israel and what it what what society Zionism has built for Israelis themselves. Uh, I think it's very, very hard for you to argue that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitic when you really look at those things. And I think I'll just leave it there. Thank you. Um, thank you, Faisal. Um, the next question is to Abrar. Um, I'd like to hear your opinions on the different ways in which we can simultaneously acknowledge the history of Palestinian expulsion in Kuwait post-1991 and the different modalities of racism against non-citizens that exist in our context today with anti-Semitism, with anti-normalization organizing. Thank you. Okay, um, thanks for your question, Fatima and Noor. I think Noor asked the question. Um, so, so I know that there actually have been, um, you know, claims or arguments by people who are actually supportive of, of normalization um, in Kuwait, um, citing the the Gulf War specifically. Um, so their argument is along the lines of, um, you know, there was kind of like this rupture is the claim um, in our relationship with the Palestinians after the Gulf War. Um, wh why should why should we you know continue to fight for this cause and why should we continue um, to oppose normalization? Um, now I would argue that this this particular argument itself is one that is rooted in racism. Um, and one that is historically inaccurate. Um, I think that this um, particular event of um, our history in Kuwait is one that is um, definitely complex and multi-layered. Uh, I know that Sumaya covered uh, the history of um, Palestinian development in Kuwait, and I think that's um, you know a, a very large uh, part of what we're talking about here. But then I think the issue of the Gulf War is one where we need to think about um, basically the difference between the official Palestinian stance um, versus the Palestinians who lived in Kuwait. And I think there's often this um, mix up between the two. But irrespective, I think, of um, this particular argument, um, our obligation to uh, the Palestinian cause and to opposing normalization is one that is um, a, a matter of principle, right? Um, so it's not a matter of um, reciprocating 
the favor, so to speak. Um, it's not a matter of um, basically um, show, showing the same same type type of support that we uh, kind of expected, let's say, um, from from them, because we're saying that this is a matter of um, principle, a matter of justice. So it's um, not relevant, I would argue, um, to specifically focus on that. Uh, with that said, I don't think that there's uh, much disagreement uh, about the expulsion of uh, Palestinians post-1991. Um, I think most people acknowledge that this is something that happened. Um, and I also don't think that there's a denial uh, about the racism against um, non-citizens in our context today. So I wasn't quite sure about the link um, in your question between the two. Um, unless I'm, I'm, I'm making a, an assumption here, I'm assuming that what you're saying is um, that it doesn't really make sense to be anti-normalization while at the same time um, be kind of okay with the racism that we're seeing um, in the rhetoric in Kuwait uh, when it comes to uh, non-citizens. And in that sense, I absolutely agree. Um, I think that this is something that should be um, holistic and non-discriminatory, um, just like we wouldn't accept the type of racism and discrimination that Palestinians are subject to. We also shouldn't be um, tolerant of any type of racism that non-citizens in Kuwait um, are subject to. Um, so yeah, I think that these are things that you can um, definitely achieve, but I also agree that these aren't things that um, perhaps the general rhetoric has kind of reached. Um, thank you, Abrar. Um, uh, the next question is to Sumeya. Is there a list of companies tied to the Israeli occupation that should be boycotted? Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. I think that the, the tool of boycott is very important and it has to be strategic, right? So um, it wouldn't make sense to ask people to boycott every single company on the planet. It's, like, it's important to identify specific companies that are complicit in the occupation. I do want to bring in the example of the UN uh, list of 112 uh, companies that are complicit of doing business um, on, on, in settlements. Uh, so um, if you just like Google the UN uh, list uh, of, of, of U Israeli companies or just companies that are doing business, you'll find them. It's 112 companies that have been um, issued by the um, uh, UN, uh, office, uh, UN Office of uh, Human Rights, the High Commissioner for Human Rights. And this was recently published actually in 2020. So this is one useful list. Another list that you can also look at is BDS itself. So, so just Google BDS list of companies. And um, they have a list of the, the companies that, uh, that are currently being boycotted or, you know, we have this global movement to boycott. So for example, Puma, the famous uh, sports um, wear company. Um, and it's, it's put on the list right now because it's, it's a sponsor of the Israeli Football uh, Association. You have also HP because HP also helps run the ID system that Israel uses to restrict Palestinian movement. So um, I think that if you just like Google uh, BDS companies, uh, you'll see a list of the current campaign of boycott that's being done. And it's, I think it's important to kind of like tune in to the global movement so that our individual acts are uh, collective. And then if you want to look at a larger list of companies, you can also look at the UN, uh, UN list that I just mentioned. Um, so hopefully that's sort of like a guide uh, to the person who asked the question. Thank you. Thank you, Sumeya. Um, the next question goes back now to Faisal. Um, in the Gulf, who do these deals serve and who do you, and who do they work against? And I don't know if you have anything also to add on the comments that were made by Abrar as well on Kuwait. Uh, not so much, but I do want to respond to Noor's question in the comments. Uh, so uh, I absolutely agree that, that there should be movements against the kinds of uh, kind, what I what I would call a classist dimension to to uh, to social relations in Kuwait and in the Gulf at large. Uh, however, I think it, it it is also important to to kind of make space for the question of Palestine because it is not something that is kind of specific to our our just our social relations, but is something that that extends far beyond them and and both historically and and geographically. 
Uh, and so I, I, I kind of want to reiterate that, yes, there should be activism against racism. Uh, there should be an acknowledgement of, of the, the violences that Palestinians have, have suffered in our own societies. But, but I'm not 100% sure that that should, should be the crux of BDS and anti-normalization organization. Uh, and that's kind of what I want to say on that. Uh, we can have. A, I think there's really room to discuss this, uh, but I think that there is a that there's a kind of uh, there is a space to do different things, and the space uh, of BDS and anti-normalization organization and anti-Israel activism, I think has has enough room and, inter and enough internationalism that that it kind of deserves to stand on its own, especially in a historic moment right now. Where, where there's an assault on Palestine, and there's an assault on Palestinians that is uh, very big and very clear. Okay, as to who these deals, uh, who these deals benefit, it's obvious they benefit capital, they benefit capitalism. A lot of these deals are built on on technology transfer. A lot of them are built on securitization. So they benefit the state and the diverse states, and they benefit capital. And they benefit the states these days in a very significant way in, in the question of Iran, which is kind of the elephant in the room, but it's a really big elephant. And, and it's not for nothing that normalization has arrived at a moment when, when saber rattling with Iran is the highest it's ever been in the region. Uh, and where Israeli saber rattling against Iran is also the highest it's been in a long time. So I think those are important things to keep in mind. But yes, they benefit the state and they benefit capital, as do, unfortunately, <laughs> most things that happen in our world these days. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you so much, Faisal. Um, the, next, the next question is kind of a combination of two questions that I will pose to Abrar. Um, first, what would be the best response to any attempts at naturalizing Israelis in the GCC? And then the second question is, why are our rulers incentivized, incentivized to normalize relations, um, given that Israel are considered breaking international law concerning human and civil rights? Thank you. Sorry, I keep forgetting about the mic. Um, thank you, Fatima, and thank you to the person asking the questions. Um, honestly, I think this question um, on, you know, how to respond to attempts to naturalizing um, Israelis in the GCC, one, is uh, quite a horrific prospect to consider, and two, goes back to this question of positionality. Um, so we're still talking about, you know, um, six Gulf states, each with a distinct uh, political system, each with a distinct um, uh, naturalization process each with distinct uh, citizenship laws. So I, I guess it would depend on which case it is that you're talking about. Um, in Kuwait's case, for example, I, I wouldn't see that being um, an issue, even if, um, hypothetically speaking, um, Kuwait were to um, normalize um, but purely by virtue of the fact that um, to make such an amendment to the citizenship law, um, then that would have to go through uh, Parliament first. Um, in the case of Bahrain, um, I think maybe Sumeya might be better suited to speak to that. But I think on a general basis, we're talking about first the prerequisite of um, amending the citizenship law so that they could even be um, you know, qualified uh, for this. And um, the, the best response I can um, consider in this potential um, scenario is to be as politically active as possible. So if you do have um, any type of election, and I know that Bahrain does have um, elections, although they might vary um, from uh, what we have in Kuwait, but that's, I think, one avenue um, to definitely try and uh, push on as much as possible. Um, as for the second question about um, uh, why Israel would be incentivized to normalize when Israel is considered a major human rights and civil rights violator in international law. Um, I, I, I would honestly say, I mean, the, the track record that our own um, countries have when it comes to human and civil rights are not 
um, all that great either. Um, so I think it's not all that surprising that you, you don't see as much um, of an objection, let's say, to the fact that it is a major um, human and civil rights uh, violator. I think it goes back to you know what Faisal was saying about the elephant in the room. Um, I do think U.S. pressure is um, a valid factor in these particular scenarios, um, although it definitely doesn't take up um, all of the justification. Um, in, in Kuwait's case, for example, this is um, hi historically not something um, that uh, has kind of defined the relationship of uh, Kuwait with the United States. Kuwait's foreign policy by and large um, throughout its history has been one that is um, independent and doesn't um, take orders, so to speak, um, from the United States. Um, so in terms of values, yeah, uh, I, I don't think that um, our countries are ones that necessarily would um, take issue with um, having an international um, partner, let's say, um, that has horrible human and civil rights records. Because if we're looking at, I think, all of our other uh, major allies, it's not necessarily um, a fact that, you know, all of them have a decent human rights record. Um, thank you, Abrar. Um, I think our time is up. Um, so I just want to kind of wrap up um, and thank everybody for showing up for this conversation and for, for all your amazing questions. Thank you, Abrar, Faisal, and Samaya for all the important themes that you touched upon in this talk. And finally, just well, I just wanted to give another shout out to all our organizers, the Gulf Coalition Against Normalization, the SJP at Georgetown, and the Palestine Students um, Club at Northwestern. Um, those talks will hope will hopefully be taking place on a regular basis, and they have or have already been taking place on a regular basis. And we hope to see you all again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.